you say show business is a profession I regard as a survival course. Yes. I think it's just a case of hard work, applying yourself, examining what you do, and seeing if you can improve it next time, if you can polish it a bit more. I'm very sceptical of these actors who say, I never read my reviews. Oh, no, no. I read everything that's written. And if it's not very complimentary, I think, well, that chap didn't warm to it. Why? Maybe there's some reason. Maybe I should look into it and find out and address that. And maybe I can find a way to make it more acceptable in the future. I mean, just a minute's a very good example. It's been going for 40 years. It was... Um, it was very haphazard and very rough around the edges. And I didn't particularly want the job. I was landed with it. But you find a way to make the job work for you and for the show. And slowly, as you progress, you refine what you're doing and you refine the rules to some extent. And the only reason it's achieved its longevity, I believe, is because as the years have gone by, one has sharpened it up in different ways. And as the new young comedians of a different generation have come in with their different approaches and different attitudes, I blend it with this so I can work comfortably with the Paul Mertens and even the younger comedians who are coming in. And um, you advance it and you polish it and you hone it. And that's what's happened with Just a Minute. And so that's a survival show. It survived and it's still going strong. There was a point 20 years ago when it looked as if your career might be over. You were thinking of retiring to Spain and then no it, no never retiring no I never you were gave, going to go to Spain no, no I never gave up no someone put the suggestion to me your daughter yes my darling daughter whom I adore and is very perceptive she said dad you've achieved an awful lot you're a place in Spain you've probably got enough she said if you were to sell up and come and live here which you enjoy you could probably retire and do your water skiing run a water ski school or something like that and um, and you'd have a, a lovely way of life and I could come out and stay with you in the summer, you know. Uh, you know, she's a great sense of humour. And I thought about it, and I said, Susie, you paint a, a lovely picture. And I would enjoy it. I enjoy living here. I enjoy the atmosphere. I enjoy running a ski school or something else like that. But I also like my profession. And I like achieving in my profession. So as much as that is the, the other side of me, the relaxed side that enjoys his free time, I couldn't do it forever. I had to get back and uh, keep polishing what I already knew. But the reason that your daughter made that mm. suggestion, which, as I read it in the book, it was a rather kind uh, gesture, oh, yes. was that it did look, and you, you feared this, there was a moment 20 years ago when it looked as if your career might be dwindling mm. to nothing. Absolutely. And I think if you examine the career of any successful person, it, it's, it's like a graph, because if you have a graph in show business... It can't keep rising because you, you reach a peak for something you do. Sometimes you can't top that. So you, you take a dip. But you've got to find a way to come up again like that. Born 1923 in Grantham, Lincolnshire. Mm. Um, for a while in your career, you were quite cagey about your birth date, weren't you? Still am until you revealed it now. <laughs> <laughs> but, now that's, you but that's what you journalists do. You have an absolute thing about people's age. You know, if you can still hack it at a certain time, if you've still got your strength and your physically and mentally, and you can still perform, it doesn't matter what age you are. A newspaper diary went and got your birth certificate yes, at one point. Yes. I mean, it got that. Yes. I mean, I can tell you the story of that, because that, it was the Daily Express, it was the Hickey column. And, and I think the journalist I'd spoken to was a bit niffed by the fact that I wouldn't give him my exact age. I said, you can put down whatever age you like. I don't mind. And he took this up. And he said, oh, we're going to have a competition this week. We're going to give a bottle of champagne to the person who can get Nicholas Parsons' correct age. And they went to Somerset House and they photographed my birth certificate. I don't know whether this is illegal or not. If it was, maybe they were being very clever. Because every day, for five days, they showed a section of my birth certificate. <laughs> I was a bit niffed about this. And on the end of the fifth day, they revealed the exact age and somebody got a bottle of champagne. You mentioned my daughter earlier on, who's a very bright sparky person she's full, and she's full of humour which I hope she gets from her dad uh, but, but she's got this great sense of balance and I said I'm a bit niffed about this and she said dad look at it this way some people would give anything to get a mention in Hickey Column you've been in it every day for five days I said darling you're lovely 
you were the second most famous British figure to come from uh, Grantham at yes, that time. Yes, that's right, yes. And the legend is that you, your father brought Margaret Thatcher into the world. Yes, that's right, because uh, she was then Margaret Roberts. And my father was a doctor in a practice, in a, in a, in a partnership there. And uh, amongst his patients were the Roberts family. And so he administered to them always, whatever. And uh, he never spoke about it, except I knew he was... Because I was only eight when I left Grantham. So it didn't mean anything to me that the Roberts family were his patients. It's strange how people said to me, oh, tell me, what was Margaret Roberts like? Was, well, I don't remember. Because she was just a, a little girl who was um, in the town, and so was our little boy then. So your nickname at school was Shirley? Only for a time. <laughs> Oh, there's a lovely story about that. Would you want it? Yeah. When your chums at school, this was my prep school colleague called, used to say to you, what are you going to do, uh, Nicholas? And, you, no, no. and I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be an actor. Now, the, the one child actor they all knew was Shirley Temple. And they said, oh, you're going to go into the films? I said, oh, I don't know. I mean, yes, anything. So they nicknamed me Shirley because I wanted to be an actor. And I was actually quite proud to, to have this. I mean, I was associated with somebody who was in the cinema, and, and um, it seemed quite an accolade that my chums would call me Shirley. Until one day, my mother, she never collected us from school. I used to go walk up the road to Hammersfield Broadway and get the tram back to where we were then in Clapham. And, and uh, she said, I'm going to collect you. I've forgotten, which is very bad of me. And so she left the car and came into the playground, and I, I enjoyed myself at that school because I'd been for two years at a miserable boarding school, which was absolutely archaic. And I was almost one of the last to leave, so I was playing in the playing room. She came in, she said, I'm looking for my son, Nicholas Parsons. And this boy shouted out, Shirley, your mother's here. And of course, she was horrified. And you know, there's a great stigma against, you know, something that had any hints of being gay. We didn't call it gay then. Effeminate, they would have said, wouldn't they? Would have been. Effeminate, yes. And when she got me in the car, she said, Nicholas is dead, or they're calling you Shirley. I said, yes, isn't it lovely? She says, disgraceful. You've got to stop it. You've got to stop it. She was very autocrat. Stop it immediately. Must stop it immediately. You were apprenticed um, in, a, in a Glasgow engineering yard. That's right, yes. Um, it happened because uh, uh, when my parents said to me, what are you going to do? They took me away from school a bit early because they thought I was an achiever. My uncle took a hand and got in touch with... Because I've always been very good at making things. I've always had lots of tools. I've got clocks at home which I mend and repair. Uh, why don't you become an engineer? You know, I wasn't going to be an actor. I didn't give a damn what I did. They got in touch with relations in Scotland, got in touch with friends, and they set up for me to start an engineering apprenticeship on Clydebank with a firm called Drysdales, who made pumps and turbines. And the next thing I knew, I was on a train during the war in the Black Art, going up to Glasgow. I was only just over 16 years of age, and now I did it now. I got to the YMCA, got myself some digs, found myself a boiler suit, and the next day I was on a tram car in the Black Art, in the winter, snow on the ground, going down to Yoko on Clydebank to start this apprenticeship. And of course, it was all dark as you walked towards the yard, and they all seemed to be speaking a different language. I tell you, I go for I tell you, know, Jimmy, but hey, And you know, and also it was a living experience because I, uh, I discovered I had to get a bit closer because I discovered they were using words as adjectives I'd only seen written on laboratory walls before. But it really was a, uh, it was tough and compromising. And people think now, I think myself, how did I survive? But I did survive. I suppose it's, a, again, I've always found throughout life that humour is the greatest catalyst of all. And the fact that I'm a mimic and can mimic people, I started talking to these uh, other fellow apprentices. If I was strange to them, if they were strange to me, I was an absolute oddball to them. But I could take off the gaffers, as we call them, the foreman which endeared me to them, and we'd laugh. I did five years. I got to university for a spell, but technically I was never cut out to be an engineer. But practically I was very good. I did a good apprenticeship, and I got my lines, as it's called, qualified marine mechanical engineer, and was accepted to the Merchant Navy. Never sailed because I became very ill and was eventually discharged from everything. There were only three things that a man could do at university during the Second That's right. World War, of which engineering was one. Otherwise it would have been doctor or vicar? Uh, women, could, but, but men could not go to university to study because uh, uh, they only wanted people who were going to come out to be doctors or clergymen or engineers because engineers could help the, uh, uh, um, the war effort. Mm. 